Okay, uh, I was, uh, let's, let's start with one, let's start out with one, a nice with one breaker? thing. And oh. I keep trying to say, let's get one thing straight, and I can't get the sun out of my head. So, let's get one thing straight. Christine's looking real hot today. Whoa! But, that's not what I expected you to say. Thank you. I took a shower for the first time in six days, so that's... I, where I'm at. <laughs> also, your lipstick color is slamming. Thank you. I picked up the wrong one, and it's incredibly dark. So, um, you know, I'm just like vibing. It's, yeah, it's feeling like, vampiric. Yeah, it's the one I wear on stage usually because it's like so uh, intense. But you know, I figured why not just show up at my best for you today with clean hair and makeup on. Well, then let's get a second thing straight. Apparently, Christine's insides are not good. I don't I've understand. Done something, I've done something that I've really. Here's what I'll say. I've really done it this time. Um, okay oh, well, this time okay i've really done it this time um i punctured my eardrum <gasps> that was a bad time to take a drink wait did you put more lemons in it or something no what did you do what happened i did the biggest gravest sin that blaze could ever have ever begged me not to do and i swore like upon marrying him like our vows were basically just don't f put a fucking q-tip in your ear and i said sure i'll never do that and i lied um and so i i don't know i must have done it with a q-tip you didn't even feel it happen well i'm sure i just poked it one too many times i don't know but i it was feeling weird and i was like uncomfy and i've i Okay, here's the thing I did. I, I am, oh my god, I bought something off oh, TikTok, just know. and it's like one of those cameras that you stick in your ear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that sounds that sounds right up your alley. Um. And I, I was so scared to tell Blaze, but then one day I was looking in my ear and I went, "That looks like a hole in my eardrum." And so then I said, Blaze, I need you to look. And he says, let me get my autoscope. And I said, oh, I bought one off TikTok. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> okay, as long as you're not putting Q-tips in your ear, that's fine. And I went, well, I've done both of those things. And he said, okay, sit down. I have a photo. Actually, maybe he'll let me post it. I don't know. It's a photo. He said, okay, come upstairs. Like, uh, Leon was in bed. So he's like, come upstairs and I'll take a look at it. I walk upstairs to his office or like, I don't know, his room. And... um. He has like his like weight bench out mm -hmm. and he has a headlamp on and he's like holding an autoscope. Oh and my he's god. Like, Take a seat. <laughs> Take like, a oh, seat. No. He has a towel. He like puts it on. He looks at my ear and he's like, damn, like there is so much earwax in there. And I was like, I know, but I keep using a Q tip to try to get it out. He goes, Christine, that's what I've been trying to tell you. Q tips like compact the earwax in. You're not getting mm. it out. And I was like, shit. So then he looks in it and I said, I don't know. It looked funny like something was wrong with this one. And he goes, babe, your eardrums perforated. And I went, oh my God. Oh my God. And so anyway. I like to think he says that to his patients too. He starts with babe, babe every time. <laughs> I know. And babe, he said, don't your worry. Your eardrums perforated. I used to do this all the time in the ER. And I went, well, why would you have to do this in an ER? And he's like, Christine, 99% of the things I did in the ER were not emergencies. And I was like, okay, fair. <laughs> so he looked at it and he said, you need to go see an ENT just in case and like keep an eye on this. So he made me buy like waterproof earplugs for the shower. And basically it, it, it's supposed to heal on its own. I have to be really careful to not get infected, which, you know, me pouring lemon and, and juice into things like that's a really big ask. And so <laughs> he said, go. So I made an appointment with an ENT they had an opening next week in a few days and basically if it doesn't heal within I think like a month they have to do surgery <laughs> oh my so god fuck my life um I mean I'm hoping it's just gonna heal it's definitely still very much perforate because the thing I bought on TikTok you can take pictures mm -hmm. so I took a bunch of pictures of my eardrum being it perforated. sounds like you you diagnosed yourself it sounds that's like exactly it was what I did. actually useful that's exactly what i did and i didn't need a license i just needed a um 14.99 and a tiktok account and <laughs> um you know it's the sketchiest thing ever but it was the only thing i've ever bought on tiktok and i'll say it was worth it um so that's where i'm at everything hurts my head just hurts it feels like somebody like poked a hole in my brain because i guess they kind of did 
Um, and it, by as someone, I mean me, myself, right, and I. Right, right, right. Yeah. Hmm. So wait, it says so. Did it? Does it feel like it's perforated? Like when? I guess like does it feel any different than like a normal headache? Like what's the? It it's really weird because I thought like oh if you because Blade said oh you'll know like he always said you'll know if you've perforated your eardrum. Clearly I didn't. Um, but apparently it hurts like right at the start like when you first do it mm. it's like motherfucker it hurts okay mm -hmm. and i'm like oh i probably had those moments with a q-tip that must be what happened um and then it just feels i don't know it feels just like i have an earache sort of okay but Oy. i feel like now that i'm aware of it i'm like constantly thinking about it mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so i just feel like i have just kind of a low-grade headache all the time um but i kind of always do anyway so it's like well it's just everyday life but so i'm the my biggest stressor right now is that i'm gonna go into the doctor and have to tell her like why i did what i did even though I know. I mean, I you won't have. be the first person to say I used that is, tips. That is true. Um, but so uh, this is my warning to everybody because I've been warned so many effing times. I have I've known I warn other people all the time. I'm like, don't put a Q-tip. But I thought, well, but I know I know how to do it the right way. <laughs> OK, I'm like, I'm really careful. I'm really careful. Um, please be fucking careful because those things like literally just pop your fucking eardrum open and then you might have to get surgery. So be careful, please. You know, you could go to the doctor, get your earwax flush out. It's easy. It doesn't hurt. And it's way more effective. And I'm doing that from now on. So, oh, I've made a big mistake. How are you, Em? I'm fine. I have anxiety today, and I I don't know if it's for anything in particular. By the way, we have um our tour coming back. So, it just Couldn't this be is that. my reminder at the beginning of the show that uh please go get tickets for our shows uh a lot of uh shows have already sold out so um if you want your last shot at seeing on the rocks before well, we go on another tour it's a little uh, sad isn't it it's yeah it well it's sad because i think <laughs> here for the booze literally lasted us like three years <laughs> that's why it feels weird to me so this feels like a blink like it feels which like is wait funny a second because... we're done already but we've been doing it for over a year or i guess almost a yeah year? we still missed a whole tour season with it so uh yeah. so we should have been done with it by now so we're and still, it still dragging feels... shit out <laughs> i know we can't stop ourselves no. um so anyway i don't know if it's because of the tour or just christmas in general anxiety um because uh I, I just i have a lot to do before i leave and i leave relatively soon and so i'm just thinking about like laundry and packing and not only that but i'm not coming back until after our first leg of the tour so i have to pack all of our oh, tour God. stuff and yeah. so i'm like i just want to make sure i don't forget anything our script i got to make sure i pack our fucking script oh, for lol fuck's sake. um so it's just like a lot of little things that i and then around the house like i want to like clean and stuff before i'm gone for a month and you know it's just uh, you know it's just a lot so it's just a lot anyway i i feel a little anxiety i also just took my anti-anxiety medication so hopefully it simmers down in a oh, little bit oh <laughs> um, what anti uh, uh propranolol no a paxil i don't know oh. if it's working oh but um it's a theory with my passing out they are thinking that uh because i i mean i'm sure i needed anti-anxiety medication and i just wasn't taking it but um no comment the running theory now is that covid attacked my uh what was the what's the 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 nerve here your your vagus nerve my vagus nerve and um which we already kind of suspected because it set off my svt worse than it ever had been and all this other stuff um but on top of that if it affected my vagus nerve that would explain why maybe i'm having like the theory is that i'm having adrenaline dumps that are they were once controllable, but now that my vagus nerve is all out of whack, that my I have random bouts of like adrenaline shooting, and then that's what causes Super. me to pass out. Yeah, so they're thinking if Isn't they put adrenaline me supposed to make you like run from a bear, like why is it making you pass out? It seems like not helpful. No, I think it's because it's supposed to um, direct it to the right spots, and it's oh, not being directed to the right spots or something. Right. Okay, that um, does make sense. I think that's the, the so this is the new working theory that my doctors are doing where they're putting me on anti-anxiety medication to keep down the adrenaline dumps so that way maybe I won't pass out. I don't know. It's I mean it sounds like a good plan. I pff, 
hell if I know. I'm only an ear specialist at this point, but I can see what t- TikTok says. So anyway, if you, you or you can go to Blaze's weight bench and take a seat and you with his like cave it, mining you know. headlamp. Yeah, um, you need to like see the photo. I'm gonna send it to you guys actually while we're t- talking because I was laughing so hard. I don't think he even knew I took a photo. So so um, anyway, uh, I'll if with you him come before we post it, if you come to one of our shows and I pass out. I would like all of you to sign a statement for my doctor that it's not working. And so uh, we have to try another uh, course. So course of action. <laughs> well, um, I think it's going to be great. Do I sound convincing? Mm-mm. We'll see. No, not at all. Okay. Well, uh, uh, you are well, going to nail it. Okay. We're going to nail it. We're all our health. Uh, all our health. Oh, I forgot. Also, Gio ate a bunch of chocolate and then vomited all night. So I haven't slept either. I just feel like the world is just, it's a mess. That's all. Well, I don't have to tell you, Christine. Mm -hmm. I I feel like I, my whole body just feels like a big ball of yarn and every little string is a different, like, overwhelm. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Of course, uh, Mercury's in retrograde right now, I think. So that would explain some of it. It's but actually Mercury is retrograde. I'm just saying for before we get corrected. Mercury is retrograde? Yep. It's not in retrograde. It's just retrograde. Oh. Fun fact. Okay. What about all the times that we've said it's in retrograde? Well, we were incorrect, unfortunately, but that's okay. Oh. Is this something <laughs> you just learned? Because you're saying it like you've known it for a decade. No, i known it for a while, but I just figure it never came up again. So I was like, well... Now it came up, so here it is. All right, well, tell everyone on Etsy who has shirts, you know, that say... Oh, oh I know. Yeah, so, okay. <laughs> Including me, I think. I think I literally saw a design on there that says... Uh... Anyway. Well, what do, do you drink this uh, week, Christine? I mean, I'll be honest with you. I um, I hope it doesn't become relevant, but I did take half of a um, a delta eight gummy because my head is just like pounding so i was like okay i'm gonna take like one of my little like um daytime gummies um so i hope i don't act really cuckoo bananas i I shouldn't i only took half of one but i'm just drinking water with it what's your pain level right now out of 10 only like a four i don't know okay three this is where I should probably thank you publicly for letting us move our recording to now because I had a migraine the other day. <laughs> oh, well, we're falling apart, and I think we both know that. So anytime something happens, we're like, just just put the covers over your head just for rest. Please I know, but like recover. the fact that I had a head thing and I was like such a wimp that I had to like you were bail. Not. You had a migraine. That's no fucking around with that. No, right. no. Well, before your head thing turns into worse or your ear thing turns into two ears like, perforated or something. I think, okay, here's my other thing. I think what? I might have accidentally perforated the other one. Christine. I think actually Blades might have, but I don't think he will admit to that. So can you imagine? Was... It's like it's like when you're cutting someone's hair and then you mess up and you hear them go, <gasps> oh, like I bet what if Blaze did that to your ear? And you then he's like, that wasn't me. It was a yeah. Q-tip. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think he did. I'm gonna, well, I mean, I'll find out in the next few days. So I'll find out. But if it is, then I'm blaming him because uh, cause I, cause I can. Okay. Yeah, that's a good reason. And I want to. Well, let me tell you uh, a fun little tale while I have your attention before Yay. it fades quickly. Um, before I'm just horizontal. <laughs> um, you could be horizontal if you'd like. And Oh, that would be nice. What if I just came down? I do have this new boom mic that like swings around. Yeah, you can just if you'd lower, like. Lower it. If you could get the camera to face you, it would be a terrible angle. But if you really needed to just lay down, we could do that. <laughs> Maybe one day we have a nap episode where we tell our stories while lying down. That would be so cozy. That would be. Actually, we should do that. I like that. Maybe we'll do our after chat laying down. (sighs) Okay. Doesn't that sound nice? Or after hours. Sorry, I keep calling it the wrong thing. Or after something. Yes. Uh, Okay. Let me tell you this story. It's a a 101, but it's got some good um, uh, examples that are more story-like. So. Cool. Have you ever heard of the third man syndrome? No, wait, maybe? No, I don't think so. It sounds familiar, but maybe I'm just inventing that. 
interesting. It's that's ironic because that's oh. how a lot of people feel about third man syndrome. Oh, um, no. I'm like, am I the third man? I don't know. So third man syndrome is a phenomenon that a lot of people report uh, for centuries, and it's um, it's in dire circumstances. So I would like to test out the third man syndrome when I'm on stage next time, since that okay. is a dire circumstance for me every night. But during traumatic experiences, much more dra- traumatic than like being on a stage, um, this is when some people remember an unknown person uh-huh. helping them through the ordeal until they got to safety. Of course, I love these kind of stories. So once the person is removed from the situation, they discover that nobody was ever with them. <gasps> So it's like, was it a hallucination? Was it a guardian angel? Like, what? what glowing man with a halo? Yeah. <laughs> he was right there driving a truck. Jesus? <laughs> no. Um, so it all starts, or the name at least starts, in the early 1900s. Have you ever heard of a man named Ernest Shackleton? Yes, I sure have. He's an explorer. Yes. Did you also have to read that book in middle school? I have no idea. What book? Oh, how do you know who he is? Didn't he go to Antarctica? Yeah, but how did you learn about him? I don't know. I just know it in my head. Maybe he's the third man. I don't know. Oh. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I don't know where. I, I actually have no idea. I just That's wild. Isn't it funny? Like Sometimes you just have a random bit of trivia and you're like, how that entered my, my world, yeah. I'll never know. And it feels good because usually if I am at trivia and I say, I know this one, my brother and all his friends are like, yeah, we all know this one. And I'm like, well, shit. You all know who are. Congratulations. Um, You're the Zandy Schieffer of this show. Because I, I definitely don't know as much trivia as you do. Well, that's... Wait, what was the book? Maybe I did read the book and that's how I know. I don't remember the book. I but. don't remember what the book was called. It was it some boring. That's why I didn't read it. I probably it didn't in read it. School. <laughs> that's um, my guess. <laughs> no, let me... Let me earn it, Ernest Shackleton book. Ugh. <laughs> it, w- <laughs> it was called... In no, I don't know what it was called. Are you talking about Ernest Hemingway? No, 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 no. It was um, it is Ernest Shackleton. But there was a book that I had to read, and it looks like there's a bunch of different books. I don't know which one is the one that I had to read. But in sixth or seventh grade, I had to read a book about Ernest Shackleton, which is how I know about him. Got it. And by the way, that the irony is like I don't know even know what the book was fucking called. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure I cheated. I had to have because I mean, I'm also pretty sure about that. I wrote Just a based paper on your own stories. We all had to write a paper about this Ernest Shackleton book. And I like this teacher, by the way, I like to her and one other teacher in my school. I'll call them Mr. Feeney because they were my teacher <laughs> from like sixth grade until the day I graduated. Her and I did not like each other. We never did. Mm. At least that's my memory if she would like to weigh in. But we did not like each other. I hope um, not, because that would really scare me if our <laughs> teacher started weighing in. I can't handle that. You know, as I get older, I still follow her on Facebook. And as I become like an adult, I'm like, oh, I kind of dig you. But as a kid, I did not. Like I know. Her. I totally get that. And I think it's probably too late to fo- to forge those relationships now, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, I wrote a paper. We all had to write a paper. And I was the only one who got a 100% on the paper. <gasps> And even the teacher, she stopped the class to announce it because it was so unheard of that I would do that well on a paper. Fuck. And I looked apparently shocked because she saw my face when she said, the only person to get 100% is M. Schultz. And then I apparently made a face because then she looked at me and went, I know. (laughs) In front of the whole class was like, Um, I didn't see it coming either. so Um, So how did that happen? I don't know. I must have cheated. I don't. I can't imagine that I just got a hundred out of nowhere. I don't know. I don't even remember wow. writing it. I don't remember reading the book. I don't you remember know. print printing it. From I remember printing it. Computer? I remember. <laughs> I remember seeing a one hundred on it and being like, "This, <laughs> this can't be right." Like, it was did like, your maybe... mom say anything? No, no, wow. I wouldn't. Wow. I I just kind of tucked it away. It was anyway. That's how I know about Ernest Shackleton. I'm so intrigued. Okay. I I don't have that paper anymore to even begin to tell you how I wrote oh, it. Oh, I but bet I'm, she does. I, I bet she remembers at least a little bit, and that's it. Huh. Ernest Shackleton. This was in 1907. He, and for those who don't know who he is, he led an, uh, an, expedition, an expedition in Antarctica that earned him knighthood in England, um, mm-hmm. making him Sir Ernest Shackleton. With the name Ernest Shackleton, he was meant to have knighthood. <laughs> He needed a title. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 
Uh, a few years later, his most famous expedition was where he and his crew attempted a 1,700-mile transcontinental journey to completely cross Antarctica, but their mm. ship became entrapped in ice. This is what the book was about. Their ship became entrapped in ice, and they were trapped there for nine months as the ice oh. slowly crushed their ship. <laughs> okay, well, maybe you did read that book. Like, maybe that was the only one you read because you were like, this is actually kind of interesting. It may be, yeah. Um, so they're trapped. Their ice, ice is slowly crushing their ship, and eventually the ice fully squeezed the hull apart, and they had to abandon the ship. <gasps> and they had limited provisions and were still surrounded by ice, so they had to set up camp on drifting sheets of ice. Oh, God. <laughs> they lived on these sheets of ice until the ice finally broke apart for them to navigate their smaller boats to an uninhabited island. And then Ernest led several crew members on a 16-day, 800-mile journey in a lifeboat to a whaling station to seek help. But once they got there, they then had to hike for 36 straight hours to the other <gasps> side of the island for help. Like, ev it's like... This is nightmare. Nightmare. Truly. Like, every... Can you imagine being told, oh, it's going to be 1,700 miles... And then it's like, just kidding, we're actually trapped here for almost a year. And then no. it's, just kidding, now we have to live on sheets of ice. Oh, just kidding, then we have to do another 800 miles. Just kidding, now we have to hike for 36 hours. And by and the way, what? you're always wet and you're always cold the whole time. Oh, can you imagine? Every like Every second, you're cold and wet. How many of them must have lost toes? Like, I wet, mean, cold all, toes. All. And then you hike 36 hours with no toes? Forget it. Oh. I literally, I can't even hike on a 70 degree day on a flat road. Like I <laughs> In can't Los Angeles. imagine <laughs> for 15 minutes. I'm exhausted. I'm like, can we go back yet? <laughs> like, are we at the whaling station yet? And we're at fucking, what's I that place like called? I don't even I remember be... the name of the hike. What's the hike in LA? The observe where the observatory oh, the is? Griffith Park? Griffith, Griffith Park. Park. Yeah. I feel like I could be sitting in my car in traffic and I'd be like, I'm basically on a sheet of ice for nine months. <laughs> like, like floating <laughs> away with no provisions. <laughs> oh, man. They would take one look at me and spit on me and I'd be like, I understand. You um, would be unknighted. I don't know what the opposite of being knighted is, but that would probably be what yeah. happened. Yeah. <laughs> but they just take my own name away from me. Yeah, they'd, they'd be like, like, you don't deserve even that. <laughs> yeah, no identity for you. Um <laughs> In the end, after all of that, every single member of the crew was rescued safely. All of them survived. All of them. I thought for Whoa. sure at least 90% of them would be dead. Like it was just thought. Ernest Shackleton standing alone by the end. He left. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm honestly very surprised by that. Wow. I feel like I, I'm sure, I'm sure like someone's going to call me on and be like, there is, there is. But I feel like this story is wild enough that there should be more movies about it. Like recently, like more like. Like they should like, like modern... revive it, you know? Okay, let's do it. Oh, okay. Who's gonna I mean, play you Ernest? Read the book. I'll play the ice sheet. <laughs> Can I just sit on you? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I'm cold. <laughs> I think I got um, the part. Yeah. Oh no, you nailed it. You're you're <laughs> shooing. Yeah. Um, so Ernest later recalled during this whole trek, having a strange experience where, where while hiking, he kept feeling as if there was an extra presence with them. Mm. He even wrote in his journal that during that long and racking march, it seemed to me often that there were four, not three, because this was at a time when he only brought three with him. Ooh. Um, two, or no, he uh, brought two, two with him, Yeah, right? two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, he only brought some of them to get help for the rest of them. Um, so, yeah, he thought there were four, not three. Wow. Later, the other men told Ernest the exact same thing had happened to them where <gasps> they could have sworn there were four of them instead of three, even though Ernest himself had never mentioned this phenomenon Ooh, to them. Ooh, that is creepy. In 1922, there was a poem by T.S. Eliot published about, um, about the Ernest Shackleton story. Okay. And the poem was called The Wasteland. And mm -hmm. in it, he alluded to Ernest's story of there being a fourth person. Um, for artistic license, I guess, he changed it from a fourth person to a third person. Yeah, just I like to, that. Like, I, just, yeah. I had I a guess, feeling that's what. <laughs> it made the poem flow a little better, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
But in the poem, he says, who is the third who walks always beside you? When I count, there are only you and I together. But when I look ahead up the white road, there is always another one walking beside you. Uh, Gliding wrapped in a brown mantle, hooded, I do not know whether a man or a woman, but who is that on the other side of you? It was just this, oh, there's a a random third person who keeps following us. And this poem is where we get the phrase third man syndrome. Wow. So, now, uh, several people have come forward in books, interviews, and online to share their own third man stories. And when I say several, I mean, like, by the thousands. Like, so oh, many people have had. Just a handful. <laughs> just, like a, just like a bit. A few. So there's a lot of these extra men, extra person people. Yeah. First of all, if thousands of people are having this experience, is this one third exactly. man just, like, exactly continuously on the clock? Or are there a bunch of these people in like there's a got, guild? There's got to be a bun, a guild. <laughs> yeah, there's got to be a guild for sure, for sure. Yeah, no doubt. Sometimes the third man is just a feeling or just like a presence of being watched or feeling followed, and it's never threatening. You just feel like someone's there. Sometimes mm. it feels like there's someone missing, where five people oh. can be out camping and they feel like a sixth person is supposed to be there, and they keep expecting another person, even though they count Ooh. that everyone's there. Some people have actually taken that um, so far that let's say they have like five people coming over and they'll make intentionally a sixth plate, assuming that someone else is coming. And then they'll realize that it wasn't necessary to make that extra plate. Like they, I mean, I've done that, but it's because I don't know how to count very well. But I can see why <laughs> that would be very alarming if you were like, wait a minute, I got yeah. this wrong. I'd be like, is the third man actually my second dinner? Is that what's Yeah, happening? I was going to say, I could sit in both if you have extra, you know? Yeah. That's not a problem. I'm my own third man today. That's exactly right. I'm, I'm, my, I'm my own third woman today. You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> Capital <laughs> W. <laughs> Some people experiencing this uh, have actually had visions, and they have felt like um, someone was actually with them. In 1933, mm. there was a guy named Frank Smith who was attempting to summit Mount Everest. Well, I mean, that's your first mistake, but okay. I was going to say, I was like, just, if Wait, anyone ever book? asked me. Everyone wants a fucking book about them and their big expeditions. Like, Jesus. Look, all I'm going to say is when I look at what my future holds, I could have a day left. I could have, I don't know, 80 years left. No, <laughs> 70. But, <laughs> oh. but when I tell you with confidence I will die not having climbed Mount Everest, and I'm okay. Oh, yeah. And I'm okay with that. That's, That's powerful. Like, there's just some things I know I won't do on this earth, and I've already made peace with it. I'm like, and I've not. I've done more than made peace. I've happily embraced. Happily it. embraced it. I like. I'm. There's. I can't. Uh, there's so many things I'll never do, and I don't even wish it for myself. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let the, like leave that to the people who want boring books written about them. I don't think I, I'll climb any mountain. Like, even if it's an easy one, I don't even have to use my hands. Like, I Why just don't want to do it. Unless we're stranded on an ice cap and you need to find a whaling community, then maybe. But otherwise, I don't see why you would ever have to do that. I'm also pretty positive that in life I will never be on a sheet of ice. Like, I, I wouldn't put myself in a situation where I could be on a sheet of ice, you know? The only... That 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 part gets me nervous, though, because I'm thinking, you know, global warming, I don't know, all these polar bears getting trapped, like, where... Uh, California breaks off, you know, becomes oh a sheet God. of ice. I don't know. It's all possible. I guess that's possible, but if it's survive or climb... Like, don't survive or climb Mount Everest... Guess what I'm not doing? I'll see you on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> Get your Ouija not board out. The mountain. The other side of this life, not the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Get your ovulus. I'm, uh, I'll say hi over there. <laughs> your husk is yeah. waiting. Okay. <laughs> so in 1933, Frank Smith decides he's going to climb Mount Everest, and he's attempting the summit. He only falls short by a thousand feet. At this point, honestly, like, I would be so pissed. I'd be like, give not only did Just I not it climb him. it, I was a thousand feet. I was a thousand feet away. Get, just give it to him. Come on. Honestly, there has to at least be like a like a red ribbon that they get instead yeah, of like a blue a, ribbon. You know, run, although I mean, I feel like a getting a runner up on that kind of thing would be like much more hurtful to them. You know, like that. You would at suck. least need like, I don't know, a trophy, a pat on the Part- back, a like participation something. Participation award. Let someone cut a ribbon at the opening of a festival. 
Oh, with the big scissors. Yeah, that's good. I think that's good. That's like important. maybe not a key to the city, but like a key to a neighborhood in the city. A key to the suburb. Uh, see, that's not that bad. Let's do it. Uh, he falls. He falls short by a thousand feet after the climb goes totally wrong. Also, um, falls short. You're saying he falls short of the goal, not like he falls a thousand feet, right? Like I know that that's not what you're saying. I'm just triple confirming. He's yes, you're. Fall, yes, I understand. No, I see where the confusion could be. No, he really just he just fell short. It's just like I get a, like a little spike every time you say he falls, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, okay, he falls short. Got it. I gotta check my vagus nerve. Am I also f- oh, no. spiking <laughs> your adrenaline? Um, no, he like he really just doesn't make it by a thousand feet. He was separated from his party. And he even remembers, like, while being stuck and not knowing where to go, he got out a piece of food and he broke it in half to hand it to somebody, knowing that he was alone. But he just <laughs> felt like somebody else near him needed to eat, too. Whoa. So the and third he wrote, man's hungry? Uh, right? Well, well, like, what? Now I'm glad that someone did leave extra plates of food out for him That's every exactly now That's exactly right. It makes sense. In his diary, Frank wrote, all the time that I was climbing alone, I had a strong feeling that I was accompanied by a second person. The feeling was so strong that it completely eliminated all loneliness I might otherwise have felt. So Ooh. the whole point so far of the third man is like he just makes you feel safe when like there's really very limited reason to feel safe. Um, if you're yeah, a thousand I mean, feet from the top of Mount Everest and you're alone, I wouldn't feel safe. Certainly you know? not. I... I it just reminds me of Jesus walk, you know, the footsteps and he's walking. Why doesn't he pick you up at that point? Yeah. It's just a thousand more feet. Yeah. Couldn't a miracle happen up there? No one would notice. It's literally Sometimes Everest. Sometimes I carried like, you up Mount Everest. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Step it up. Uh, He even felt like he was tethered to this companion by a rope and felt safe as if someone would catch him if he slipped he truly whoa. believed that the rope would secure him because someone was watching out for him whoa frank knew this wasn't true but he couldn't overcome the feeling and it comforted him through the event and when he finally was within sight of a camp and safety he said that that feeling of a companionship totally snapped away from him and he suddenly felt alone for the first time what the hell that is creepy the experience aligns with the way third man syndrome often uh, is referred to as a supportive presence that helps a person mm. through. And like in Frank's story, uh, once real help arrived, the person realizes that the third man is nowhere to be seen and they've been alone the whole time. Ooh. In 1916, a guy named Harry Stoker, who was the cousin of the Dracula author Bram Stoker, he escaped as a prisoner of war with two companions, and the three of them navigated hundreds of miles through the mountains without supplies. They only traveled at night and hid during the day to make sure they were never seen. And one night, in treacherous conditions, a fourth man appeared and started walking with them as if he'd been there the whole time. <sighs> it didn't even occur to them that he could be a bad guy or he would be chasing after them. They were never afraid of the sudden extra man. Um, when they would stop at night, he, this man would stand f- just far away enough, but you could see him in the dark, just out of sight. And when they started moving, he would get back in line and follow behind them just to watch Whoa. them. What? And the f- it's, when it's morning came, that people that they're all seeing, you know, they're all feeling yeah. it. Like if it were one person, I'd be like, oh, it's seeing it. I mean, this guy, this time they're seeing it, seeing it. Yeah. What the hell? When morning came, the extra man was gone and his presence had only given comfort for them to make it through the night. And it was a particularly rough night on their mm. journey. Um, but yeah, all of them said that they could see him in the distance. He never got too close, but they never felt threatened. That is so weird. And uh, so that's just a sign that the third man can also be an an active participant. Um, right. It's like not just actually a presence. Hanging around. The most famous case of the third man syndrome was on 9-11. <gasps> and there was a guy named Ron D. Francesco, and he was leaving work from the South Tower's 84th floor just when the plane hit. Oh. Um, and it hit right below him, and the wing of the plane cut through his floor. <gasps> Jesus. Uh, the floors below him were on fire. He tried going down the stairs, but 
It was impossible because of the smoke and the flames. So he tried to run up the stairs thinking he might find a different exit, but that was also impossible. He could not see anything. He could barely breathe. He truly just gave up. He just laid down in the stairwell and just accepted defeat. Um, and then he, he heard of someone say to him, you have to get up, you have to get up Mm. and felt someone grab him, lift him up and actually guide him through the open flames. Whoa. And he got down 70 flights of stairs (gasps) through the smoke and he couldn't see a single thing. He just followed this guy that was helping him. Um, got down 70 flights of stairs and he was the last person to escape the tower before it collapsed. No. He was one of only four people in the South Tower above the 81st floor to escape and he found out after the fact that nobody had helped him out. Oh my gosh. Oh my god. So now it's not just like, oh, you can see him, but there are instances where this third man is straight up saving you fully saving save your you. life um there are other people <laughs> there are other people all over the internet who share their experiences reddit is a great place if you'd like to read some third man syndrome mm-hmm. stories um one user named bobbin for bears Love uh, it. said that their father once fell off a cliff in a remote area and broke his back um and he was just stuck on this cliff and it was the small small town in alaska and he broke his back while he was just laying there thinking he was never going to get help oh my god a young girl climbs down the cliff (gasps) finds him and sits with him for hours and she keeps petting his head keeping him Mm. warm telling him stories to distract him and even takes her own coat off and puts it on him. So he remembers her coat on him. Eventually someone spots him from the water and gets help. And when help came, he asks about the little girl who mysteriously went away. And they say, there was never anybody here. There was no girl here. This is a really small town. We know everybody in this community. There is no girl like that. And, and the coat I assume was gone. The coat was gone. What the fuck, dude? I love that she had to climb down the mountain, though. She's like, I can't just appear. I got to make this look realistic. Let me climb down this mountain cliff real quick. She can't just, like, I dream of Jeannie, just blink in. Yeah, exactly. Dozens of people have shared nearly identical stories about car accidents where they were unable to Mm. move or get out, and they would hear a car pull over. They'd even hear voices telling them that help was coming. And a lot of experiences that I even read on Reddit... Um, people say that there's someone who reaches into the car to rub their shoulders or hold their hands while they wait for help. Um, this is one I just found, um, right before we recorded. This is from someone named Rocket KT69. And their story says, I was in a really terrible car accident a few years ago and I was stuck in the car. They had to cut me out. During it, I came to and there was a woman who had climbed into the rear seat behind me and was holding my shoulders, telling me I was going to be okay and that help was coming. I thought she stayed with me until I blacked out and I woke up to a fireman cutting the door off and pulling me out. The fireman, paramedics and my mother who had gotten there all quickly said there was no woman at all. That traffic had gone around and no one had stopped because the fire department was only a few blocks down the road. I can still hear her voice and I know she was touching me, but no one saw her. What the fuck? Do they have any theories? Like, was it a loved one? They think, or they just said it. They have no. Yeah, clue we'll who she we'll was. talk about that for sure. Okay. Um, but there are se- there are several stories like that on uh on Reddit where it's specifically like a lot of times it's a woman, um, but someone will just show up and just get in the car with you. Will hold your hand. Will tell you hey you know you're gonna be okay just you know people are coming help is on the way just hang on there's also a lot of people who say that there's a third man voice that they hear predicting yeah. things so they'll say like i've heard that like slow down don't you know slow down slow don't, down and don't go at like a green light like don't drive yeah and then yeah. they find out that had they gone they would have been like t-boned so like a semi drive through right right i've heard that definitely so that might be the third man that might be a completely other different thing Ooh. Um, but yeah, so there's a a lot of stories, especially about this one woman during car accidents where she will be there 
the entire time until you black out and when you come to no one has ever seen her and they think a they lot think of the stories the are woman? her i don't know if it's the same woman but a what? lot of people say that um either she just appears in your car or they even like have the whole real life experience of like hearing a car pulling over hearing her get out of the car the car door right. slamming her walking over and her and the car have, are just totally phantom um wow uh, in other experiences, yeah, people have seen someone reach in and rub their shoulders or hold their hand. In one incident, uh, or many, according to Reddit, a woman told the crash survivor that the car was on fire and they needed to get out. Mm. And the survivor was too injured and too weak, but the woman helped pull them out of the crash and move them to safety. And when they woke up, the woman was never there. He has no idea how he left the car, how he oh, got like out of it. Like how physically, how that could have happened. I've heard the, the stories like that about like ghosts. Well, actually, on Jim Harold's campfire, I feel like I've heard a bunch of those um, where people will say, you know, there was this truck, this huge white truck, and it pulled over like a semi, like an 18 wheeler. And this guy like helped pull me out. And then I was unconscious. And later, they, you know, emergency services said like there was no semi, like we would have seen a semi, yeah. like. I feel like that's a, another phenomenon, like the ghost trucker coming to help you. Yeah. So that might be an, uh, under the umbrella of third man. Um, mm. But a lot of people have that very similar experience of like, they have no idea how they got pulled out of wreckage that they shouldn't have survived, you know? Yeah. Wow. People have also seen a third person when being rescued from drowning. They say that they've seen and felt hands reach into the water and drag them oh. out and bring them to shore. Wow. In one story, there was a hiker who was lost and had gone hypothermic, and mm -hmm. they were about to lie down to go to sleep in the snow, which would have actually killed them. And in that yeah. moment, another hiker showed up and led them back to the trail <gasps> where the rest of their group was. It and gives me goose cam that they're like dressed like they're supposed to be there, you know, like they're a, they're another hiker. They're just a little girl on the path with a coat like the You know, it's like they're like materializing as as though they were like a real person just walking along, which is so creepy. I like to think they have like a costume room, like a wardrobe room. <laughs> and they're like, oh, today I got to go be a paramedic. Gotta oh, bring yeah. my parka. <laughs> well, there are also stories I saw on Reddit of people, them dressed as firemen. And so then they're like, oh, who's the one wow. that helped me? And then that guy's never been there, you know? So Ooh. yeah, it is weird that they really fulfill the role. Yeah. It's like they're like committing to the bit. <laughs> It's also like, I mean, how many times have we said that like maybe aliens show up as a form that's less scary for us? So yeah, maybe something we can understand. Yeah. It's something, yeah, that makes us feel safer in the moment. Comforting, um, sure. When that one hiker got lost and another hiker brought them back to their group, that lost hiker then told the group, hey, this guy rescued me. And that guy vanished and there were no tracks in the snow indicating there was ever a second person. <laughs> oh god this is creeping me out one person said that when they were a kid they were choking and they felt a hand grab them and drag them into another room where an adult could save them <gasps> which i love that there are some ghosts who are like i can't even save you but Just get your ass in here like i never learned here. a heimlich that wasn't part of my training <laughs> it's like i can like i don't know make a cabinet door open by itself but i can't push that food out of your throat <laughs> I can, like, use the jaws of life to get you out of an upside-down yes. car, but I don't know yeah. how to do the Heimlich. <laughs> I like to think that that kid just kind of got yeeted into, like, a kitchen or something. And it was just yeah. like, it's like just get like, in there. Chuck, come on. Uh, it's clear that the third man syndrome is uh, a very real phenomenon since thousands of people have had this experience, but nobody knows who or what the third man is. Many people think that the third man can manifest can manifest as nothing more than a feeling like i've already said people have seen him as a distant shadow or he just straight up he or she or they straight up help you physically mm. um some people think it's a divine experience like a guardian angel some people literally think it's jesus coming in like a certain form mm. that makes you feel safer people have believed that it's a deceased loved one uh who's looking out for them and has the ability to intervene in incredibly specific situations but what's interesting about that is that the third man is n almost never described as someone that people recognize mm, it's always right. a stranger right which freaks me out even more because i've always heard that rumor that like your brain can't actually create a face out of thin air like it has yeah, to come I from mean, a pulled memory 
I was literally thinking about that this morning because I was thinking about dreams as I do. And I was like, man, it's so fascinating. I, I don't know how real that is, but I always learned that as well, that like your subconscious can't create a new face or a new identity that you haven't like already seen. Yeah. By the way, mm. let me, hold on, ask me, let me finish this first because I don't have much left, but I, I want to jump back onto that because I have a creepy thing. Ooh. Um. Okay, so they say it could be a loved one, but it's never someone you recognize. So maybe it's someone from a past life that still watches out for you. Oh, maybe it's Oh, that's interesting. Or like if this is where this is not an actual theory other than my own, but in the world of like time is a construct, like maybe this right. is a future person that you don't actually know, but somehow you spiritually are already linked You're, to. You're like connected. Yeah. Ooh. Um Nobody seems to know in the moment who the third man is, only that they are always comforting. And some say Aww. it's just a helpful spirit who was in the right place at the right time and decided to lend a hand. Um, it could also be completely internal because, as we know from the gift of fear from Gavin De Becker, uh, we <laughs> often know way more than we think we do. Yes, and right, true. In a dire situation, and we've totally given up, our thoughts may give way to our subconscious, which takes over mm -hmm. and gets us to safety. So like it could just be a survival instinct, like exactly. keep walking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, in extreme cases, our will to live might be overpowered by mm. adrenaline and manifest as hallucinations that compel us to keep moving. I mean, um, if, if that is our brains, our brains are pretty fucking genius in that case, right? you know, like it's like if you think you can't do it, to, to pull you it, out of this car. I mean, it really does feel like um, what's the right word? Personifying uh, some sort of hope for yourself. Like if you don't think you can do it, this person does, you know, so like, yeah, like creating yeah, a person outside to, of yourself. Yeah. Creating someone Ooh. to believe in you. Wow. I mean, it also, if you're in a dire situation or in a traumatic event, I think that's cause for like a psychological snap of reality. Like, sure, sure. Dissociating just in a way that you're hallucinating. <laughs> yeah, like seeing something that isn't there because you're having a fucking nervous breakdown. I would. And you're um, freezing to death. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I feel like that would make some sense. Uh, and this doesn't come from any concrete research, by the way. This is all just people's theories because they can't really mm. research something unless they put people yeah. in, like, dear death experiences. It's like, here, fall short off this cliff a thousand feet. And <laughs> I then... can imagine a researcher just, like, Chuck Norris kicking someone off of Mount Everest and just <laughs> lighting them on fire or something and being like, and being like anybody well... there? Do you see anybody? <laughs> <laughs> Remember to write it in your journal. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> What if you just found out now that like Ernest Shackleton's sheets of ice was just a long con from the government? It was just like <gasps> testing the extreme they just bandwidth put him on of a, a sheet of ice, and they were like, "Let's see what this guy does. We should give Let's him just... a, a we should knight him afterward." Yeah, seventeen hundred miles of hiking was not enough. Let's do another eight hundred. <laughs> Others suggest that this is some sort of deep genetic ancestral knowledge that we can only tap into when our minds are completely empty, aka when we when we've given up. Oh. Um, which I thought was super cool though. Like, oh, maybe that these is. are actually ancestors you have no idea of that That's are looking powerful. out for you. One psychologist named Dr. Lisa Johnson encourages patients in trauma recovery to cultivate inner characters or voices of comfort oh. to help them out, which even outside of therapy, people daydream about themselves in situations they usually wouldn't be in talking to people they usually wouldn't talk yeah. to so for some reason humans like to find comfort in imagining outside encouragement than trying to encourage themselves mm, interesting i think and, that's probably why it's so effective when a therapist use that uh, technique of like your inner child like talk mm -hmm. to yourself as a child because you would yeah. talk to them differently than you talk to yourself instantly. Yeah. so i mean and they think that 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 could lead to us just having an extreme coping mechanism in mm -hmm. really bad circumstances where our minds go beyond imagining and truly believing someone is there to support us. So, right, right, right. Um, anyway, that is the third man syndrome. Wow. That was crazy. That is, wow. That was a good story. What, what, what were you going to tell me? That was creepy. Oh, I had a dream a while ago that I thought was super eerie. And I know usually you can't, um, you're not supposed to be, like we just said, you're not supposed to be able to create faces mm. that you haven't seen and all that. I think I'm like, 
at the very beginning of being able to lucid dream at the very ah, very yes at the very 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 like scratch scratch at the, the surface um it's happening everyone I'm not even trying. I think I'm just. Em and I are gonna hang out in the <laughs> astral realm. <laughs> We're gonna talk shit about all of Man. you. No. Finally, Eva. no. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, daytime is not enough. We have to transcend into literal sleep to hang out now. Maybe that's why I've been so exhausted recently. Because when I go to bed, you just still don't shut up. Um, <laughs> just a slumber party. It's like, oh my god, I'm so tired. Um, <laughs> I. So I, I when I say I'm like kind of starting to control them is uh i'm at least becoming aware of when things don't seem right and i ha Ooh. i can't f i can't fully click like oh i'm in a dream i'm just like oh that doesn't make t too much sense oh my like, god I had, so, that's it that's so close like i had a dream where i was like back at the prop house and i was answering a phone and everything seemed totally normal but the only difference was that phones would be hung upside down like it was like <laughs> It was like a black eyed kid wrote the script and it was like, yeah. and then they hung the phone upside down. So like, the, <laughs> so like the cord was sticking up instead of hanging down. Right. And I remember thinking like, that's fucking weird. And I remember <laughs> thinking like, oh, but it's a prop house. Like maybe this is like a weird prop. And then like, I didn't. I love and, that your brain's like, no, no, I got this. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. I wonder though, if like whoever controls dream world was like, uh oh, they're onto us. And like, tr like. Ah! had to shift gears real quick turn but the um, phone back turn the I phone had back a, right side <laughs> i had a dream recently though where everyone there looked really creepy like everyone's oh. face looked like it was kind of melting off of them and like Ew. like wax people or something and they all were staring at me and didn't have eyeballs Ooh. and i remember I, again i didn't i part of me must have known somewhere that it was a dream but I didn't know f at face value it you was You didn't a dream. like get fully conscious in it. Yeah, but I remember seeing it and I remember looking at them and going, this is freaking me out. You have to shift into a more human form if you want me to interact with you. <gasps> Ew, and then um... I like in my dream, like, I blinked and all of a sudden there were people standing in the exact same clothes, standing in the exact same position, all looking at me in the exact same way. Like they had completely morphed to be more palatable. They're like, is this any better? <laughs> yeah. But I said to them, I remember saying, like, I knew enough that in my head I said, you have to shift into a more human form if you want me to interact with you. And then I blink and they had shifted into people. Did you interact with them after that? I think so. Wow. But it was it was weird that I at least was able to first of all, that should have been my first clue because I can't fucking confront any conflict in real life. But like no, when I'm looking you were at just them, like, I have something to say. <laughs> I was like, y'all have to fucking change your ugly ass faces. You um, look fucking creepy. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I I remember thinking like I must be aware enough to right. know that they can shift and that but then it made me freak out even in the dream because I was like what does this mean about them? Like, what do they look like in real exactly. life? Exactly. Like, what's their real form? Yeah. Ugh. Anyway, I wanted to bring that up earlier, and I totally forgot until we talked about dreams. So, okay. Well, if you do want to lose a dream, if you write down your dreams, like handwrite them, it starts happening really often. Hmm. Okay. Because sure. you're like just aware that your dream. So, if you write down your dreams, like that should jumpstart all of it. Okay. Oh my god that's crazy you have to come over to my house if you at least a dream i went to your apartment okay. once remember <laughs> oh right 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 yes i'll have to fly over there okay my arms will be so <laughs> tired <laughs> that's all i want to hear wow okay well that was a great story um i have a story for you today it's kind of a mix of it's well it's a mix of there's like a silver lining i guess at the end which we don't often get with true crime stories. I like knowing that there's going to be I'm not it's not going to have the worst ending. I mean after BTK, I'm glad that we're having a whatever you can consider a palate cleanser in the I true know, crime world. It, and it's not a palate cleanser for sure cuz it still is unfortunately a tragic murder, but um it's definitely like I said, it, it at least has like a hopeful, somewhat uh -huh. hopeful ending, you know, Yeah, which, okay. which is rare. So we can at least know that um, going into this. But this is the Klaus family murder, and it's mm. spelled C-L-O-U-S-E. 
So let's backtrack to 1978. Uh, a young woman named Tina Lynn, she's 15 years old, and she lives in a town called Smyrna Beach in Florida. Oh, I'm sorry, New Smyrna Beach in Florida, not mm. the old one. Of course not. Of course not. And unfortunately, she had lost her father at a young age, so she was growing up with the rest of her family down in New Smyrna Beach. And it was there that she met Howard Dean Klaus Jr., who often went by Dean or Jr., and Dean was four years older than Tina. So a couple years earlier, Dean had unfortunately caught the tail end of um, a sort of cultish group called the Jesus People Movement. Uh, okay. Yeah, trust me, the names are just going to get weirder from here on out. Okay. Uh, the Jesus People Movement, which was an evangelical Christian revival that was like catered to young people. I mean, I think we all know like the 70s were very much a heyday for cults <laughs> because right you know hippie movement people were finding themselves and breaking away from the mainstream um and dean was definitely one of those guys who was easily i would say easily but who was open to being part of these kind of groups sure you know what i mean mm -hmm. So the Jesus People movement had major momentum in the 60s, and then mid to late 70s, it started to slow down. Um, it was a very new age movement, and, you know, that basically the crowd of people that it attracted were what you would call probably hippies back in the day. Mm -hmm. They baptized their new believers at beaches, and then they traveled with like-minded friends to spread the word. Um, they played rock music and threw parties. So mm -hmm. this was very much like a new twist on religion that like young people could kind of sure attach to. It's feeling a little. Um, I know it's not in this venue, but it feels a little mega churchy. Like one bajillion percent. I yeah. feel like I could have slipped into this real quick, if especially like at a time where it hadn't existed before. So I couldn't have like seen the pattern. I would have been like, right. oh, wow, rock and roll. Cool. Yeah, this is a religion I can vibe with, you know? Yes, exactly. Or and a, and a I group feel I can vibe with. Yeah, exactly. And that, that that was their whole thing. Like a cool vibe. Like we're not like every other cult and religion. You uh -huh. know? Um, And so some of them were pro psychedelics and others were staunchly sober. So they didn't really like fall in line on that front. Um, but just generally they were like the cool place to be the cool group to travel with. And, um, you know, they, they took a new take on, uh, the tenets of Christianity. Uh, and of course this movement, uh, led to several fringe groups who were more extreme. Mm. So, you know, the base, like the core of it, as we see, I feel like with so many of these kind of, um, groups is like the, at the base at the core of it it's like hunky dory you know like they're 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 playing rock music they're loving each other they're taking care of each other and then like it devolves into fringe, fringe groups that fringe, take things yeah. to dangerous extremes and give everybody else a bad name so that's kind of what was going on here um one of these fringe groups was nomadic and they would travel from town to town and when dean was 16 he encountered this group for the first time so his mom got a call uh while she was at work one day and uh the call was from dean's sister cheryl and she's like uh mom dean brought over a group of people and i'm not comfortable with them being here oh <laughs> Oof. like brought them to the house and how many people mom... do you know yes so okay. dean's mom rushes home and there are four strangers in the house Ooh. yeah it was a man a woman and two children <gasps> oh my god all four were barefoot and were dressed in white robes. It <laughs> sounds like fourth man or third man, but like <laughs> it's his whole family he brought with him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're like, today we were wearing our robes. It's bring um, your family to work day. And the third man is on <laughs> high alert. <laughs> so these people are in her house. She rushes home and she's like, oh. Dean to her son Dean why did you bring these people over um and he says oh they're just staying over for one night and mm. she's like oh no they're not <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, like, there's a hotel down the road they can go there literally I'm the still the the boss of this house so the members who called each other brother and sister sort of like nuns or monks or like you know okay. people in a religious 
order. Mm -hmm. Uh, They had recently arrived in the area and they were part of the part of a fringe sect of the JPM movement, which many considered a cult. Mm -hmm. And so they had recently arrived in the area and Dean's family had actually noticed them around town because they carried their bedrolls. They wore white robes. They didn't wear shoes. I mean, it's very. (laughs) Yeah, they're not hiding. (laughs) They're not discreet. Yeah, yeah. they don't blend in. Okay. <laughs> and apparently the reason they didn't wear shoes is that they didn't eat meat or use leather. I mean, maybe They're... there was just leather okay. shoes in the 70s. I don't know, but it seems a little bit I feel odd, like you but... could have worn a slipper, you know? Like... Right? Like, uh, I feel like there's... A flip-flop? If, you're, if you can wear your robes, surely you can find a shoe. You could wear but, socks. I mean, you could wear socks. That's a great point. You could wear, hmm. you could figure it out, you know? You could figure it out, but they didn't. And okay. <laughs> so that became part of their sort of uniform. Um, and people were nervous about this incoming crowd. Uh, some called them Jesus freaks. Um, mm. And, you know, they like. They do I sound said, like they look like Jesus a little bit with their robes the, and bare feet. Exactly. You know? I think it's like an easy association to be sure. like, and especially because their group is called Jesus People Movement, right? They're like. Yeah. They're the, they're the Jesus people, I guess. Um, and I, I, you know, to be clear again, this is this fringe group that has kind of entered town and mm-hmm. will potentially cause some problems. Uh, not the original core group. So Dean's mom said, no, 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 no. Dean, kick them out, please. Uh, <laughs> they got to go. They, they can go wherever they want, but they can't stay here. <laughs> they got to take those bare feet and trot on down the road to the Motel 8. <laughs> So she says, you got to get them out of here. But she does She does give them provisions. She gives them food. She says, like, you know, you guys take care. I just don't feel comfortable. I have multiple children under this roof. And, like, I don't want four strangers staying over. Yeah, four mouths uh, to feed who I was not prepared for. No, yeah, no, 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 no. and she she did even feed them. But she said, like, you can't sleep here. I don't feel like I trust you enough to be around my children, which I think is totally fair. Um especially because she had six children under the roof. So like it was just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, she gave them some food for the road and Dean was pretty disappointed. Um, he was so drawn to this movement. Um, he, he, I guess the way they described him was he wasn't a rebellious kid. Like he wasn't like fighting back against tradition or anything like that, but he was very free spirited. And so when he found something that he like gravitated toward, he just wanted to go, you sure. know? And so his mom explained it as he seemed like he was always looking for something in the like, world, in like life. Like to belong or something? Yeah, maybe to belong. Um, yeah, like just looking, yeah, for maybe a group or for somebody, you know, for some kind of acceptance, something. But she couldn't put her finger on what exactly it was. And she's, she thought actually maybe he didn't really know what it was either. But it felt like he was always like seeking, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think we know people who like who are like that who are kind of always exploring always trying new things meeting new people and that's just kind of how his uh i don't know how his lifestyle went so he followed after he 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 kicks them out he says my mom's not letting you stay he follows after them outside to talk to them a little more and after this day he begins spending more time with them outside the house um a few weeks later the group being nomadic left town and so did dean um unfortunately he left in the middle of the night without a word to his family Mm. uh it was unlike him to just run away from home um but still they were like man we knew he was into that group like they weren't surprised i guess they were just (laughs) okay disappointed that he had you know snuck out and run away Uh uh-huh so D- Dean was a, you know, polite, responsible kid, but, and even though he was 16, he, well, I guess like probably most 16 year olds, he wanted independence. He wanted to feel like a grown up. He wanted to make his own choices. He was mad that his mom didn't let him like, you know, bring these people over to the house. So he left in the middle of the night. Eventually he called home to reassure his family that he was okay. He actually started calling pretty regularly to touch base And then one day, a few months after he left, Dean just showed up on the front doorstep uh, back at home. He was barefoot in white robes, and he simply just started back up his old life like nothing had ever happened. Okay. He basically said not a single word about his experience with that group. He just didn't talk about it. Ooh, shady. Right? (laughs) Like, that can't be a good sign. Um, I feel feel like... like 
tell me about your time. And he, yeah. and if he went, it was fine. I'd go, what happened? What, what happened? Uh, I'd be like, okay, <laughs> hold on. Let me make some tea. I think we need to have a long night of discussion. But yeah, yeah. I, you know, I wonder, I feel like in the 70s too, or just, you know, decades ago, it wasn't as... Like, I feel like now if your child disappeared for, like, weeks at 16 and came home and, like, had clearly been traumatized or had something happen, like, there are so many more ways nowadays, like, therapy or mm-hmm. uh, just new tact- TikTok, like, literally parenting TikTok. <laughs> Pro- probably there's a TikTok somewhere, like, how to talk to your child after they've vanished with a cult for a few weeks, you know? I don't fucking know. But I feel like back then it was just like, okay, well, if he's not going to talk about it. He's not going to talk about it. So there was um uh, I went through a phase when I was a teenager where I just did not speak to my mother. I went like fucking cold shouldered her. It was like oh, did not no. speak to her. It was it was a, a a I to this day can't explain it, but I'm sure there was um some sort of like trauma I was going I mean, through there, with. There always is. Sure, sure. There's something going on, and it's my mom be. got this book called uh. <laughs> talk so your kids will listen and listen so your kids will talk and i remember being like that just sent me over the edge i'm certainly not talking to you now okay i was, I was like, gonna say if i ever laid eyes on that i'd be like well i'm ne- literally never speaking to you again like i think i would just <laughs> I that like, would like cement it in my mind i was like you know what today i thought about talking about you and talking to you and then i saw that book on the table that and i book, went right back upstairs that book i i'm with you i would have been like you have got to be fucking kidding me. how to talk so your kids will listen and listen so your kids will talk and she Got, she got it for like I think for both of us to read together and I was like oh, for God's now sake. you want us to oh, read together a, a journal that you have to fill out together oh, I was Lord, like this me. is this is the this is the opposite of how to fix this I, I gotta <laughs> say if I ever tried to cold shoulder my mom I probably would have gotten it let's just say it wouldn't have lasted I would not have it would not have lasted it didn't um, uh my my mom at one point uh snapped and it woke yeah. me out of whatever was she going on she just chucked the book at your head and was like wow that no was she a good said purchase. some pretty pretty horrible things to me oh cool but, is that uh, what the book said just fucking insult the <laughs> shit out of them maybe when you said like i'm certainly not talking to you now she's like great now i gotta do the opposite of what the book says is she whatever whatever the book did say it didn't say to react the way my mom did oh um, no <laughs> but it, it worked it was i think i'd like her anger like snapped me out of it or something i don't know i don't know what it was and i don't know did you keep a journal or a diary Mm -mm. back then okay because i i recently thought about this is probably a conversation for another day off off it's not it's for right now oh okay but it's just you and me um (laughs) i my mom reminded me of this period of time when i was like 15 where i also didn't speak to her Mm. And I had just gone through something quite traumatic that I didn't even remember until I went because my mom was explaining this to me. And I was like, that's weird. Why wouldn't I speak to you? Whatever. I found an old journal and I was I found that time period and I was reading it and I was like, oh, shit. Like, no wonder I wasn't fucking talking to anyone or to her. Um, So I like was able to match the the, you know, I was able to go back through my journal and be like, oh, I see what was going on here during this time. Now I can kind of connect the dots. Yeah, I don't know what mine what mine was to this day i feel so bad in hindsight for my mom because it had to have been really i mean i i don't even know what it would have felt like but it was a long period of time like it was oh, a, no. almost a year of me not talking oh to her. my god it was really bad i and there i there must have been something about you know my parents were getting divorced maybe my dad was getting me to side with him and you know there may there must have been something or i was gonna say i feel like the that that dynamic is already rife for you know yeah she deserves an explanation i just don't have one i have no idea i must have just shut down maybe i would i just went like kind of catatonic catatonic yeah maybe i just fully dissociated i have no idea what like psychological term there is to use did you feel like you were angry at her or did you just feel like i don't want to speak to you anyone i I don't know i still don't know i i mean i would be angry that she was trying when i just didn't want anyone to talk to me maybe in hindsight it was like i was just like really sensory overloaded and like i just like shut down and like down i i don't i have no idea what caused it but it it happened. Sorry, mom. Yeah. <laughs> but we got there. We figured it out. <laughs> I mean, hey, this listen, she calls you at least 72 times a day, so it, c- it couldn't have lasted, you know. Maybe that nowadays I'm like, "Oh my god, stop. Maybe You're I need like, to Maybe I should try that all, yeah. all over. You should Wait, wouldn't it be funny if you mailed her that book? I just feel like that would be really funny. 
<laughs> You're like, here, like, I found this. It, it, it tells Christmas. you, call me once a fucking week and that's it. Stop Boundaries. calling. <laughs> her favorite thing to do is call me and complain about her. her I think I've said it before on here. Yeah, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like she complains it's that so her not mom. Self aware. Yeah, yeah. I love you, mom. I know you're listening, but I she'll know. hear Hi, this. I love you. She'll hear this. It'll go right over her head. Nothing will change. She'll come. She'll call me to complain <laughs> about how her mom will only call her during work hours, and then my mom will go, "What are you doing?" And I'll go, "I'm working." And she'll go, "Great." Well, anyway, here's an hour long conversation. I'm like, "Go away! What are you talking about?" Anyway. <sighs> Boy. Look, you know what? She wanted. She, I. I guess I owe it to her because I didn't talk to her for a whole I know, year. So. This is like it, she, the interest has piled up. You know, it's to the interest point. is exactly what yeah, it is. It's all yeah. interest you're paying off now. Yeah. Um. Anyway, anyway, so yeah, basically, Dean pulled an M and came home and said in a white robe and said, "I'm not talking about this." So <laughs> they said, "I mean, okay, there's literally nothing we can do because they're." I don't think the book about listening and talking to your kids had been published yet. So they just had to kind of move on and they pretended like it never happened. Unfortunately, a year passed and he left again to join oh. the same group for another little stint. Like a retreat. Little... It sounds like he's going on retreats. It sounds like he's going on retreats. Um, but he's not. But he's well, I guess it depends on how you define retreat. But okay. Um, okay. they're just kind of roaming around with no shoes on, I guess. Um, sure. For all the things they're carrying, they couldn't find a way to carry some shoes. <laughs> it's just wild to me. But anyway, um, so he, he left about a year later with the same group. And a few months after leaving, he called his mom from Columbus, Ohio, and said, I want to come home. So she wired him money for a bus ticket, and when he got there, he when he got home, he once again said, I don't want to talk about it, and just left it at that. One day, Dean's younger sister, Donna Kay, brought home a friend from school. This friend was 12-year-old Tina Lynn. Mm -hmm. So Tina was actually hard of hearing as a young child, and so she struggled to keep up in school. And uh, the way her sister described her is that she was uh, basically had to become a fighter because she had to fight to keep up in school before she was ever diagnosed with or her hard of hearing, you know, was treated. So an organization actually covered the cost for her surgery um, oh, wow. to assist in her hearing. And she was able to attend a school for students with disabilities. And after several years, she was able to return to public schooling. And that's where she met Dina's. I'm sorry, Dean's younger sister, Donna Kay. So the girls became super tight BFFs and uh, Tina's parents were somewhat absent from her home. So she sort of like blended into her, her best friend's family. You know how that happens. So Tina and her brother, Les, actually ended up spending like holidays with the family. They sort of got like adopted under the same roof. Sure, sure. And over the years, like some kind of a sitcom, uh, Tina and Dean began dating. They fell in love. Lovely. She was 15 and he was 19. I don't know the rules back then. I don't know the rules in Florida now. I have no clue. But that's that's what happened. Okay. So <laughs> Les and Tina, uh, so Tina and her brother Les, they became like family, like I said. Um, and then Tina started dating Dean. And of course, uh, now they're even m more like family, right? Because she's literally dating one of them. And pretty soon they got married at a courthouse. And Tina's mom signed consent. And uh, she moved in to Dean's home with Dean, her new husband. Which wow. is, must be so weird as a sister. Yeah. Like, shit, you were my best friend. Now you're literally having sex with my brother over there? Um. That happened in my own childhood friend group where no. uh, one of a friend of ours ended up marrying Deirdre's brother. Oh, that's right. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. And so that always trips me out when I think about it. Like when you guys tell stories back then, I'm like, what a weird. Yeah. Twist. It's like us as friends or uh, when I'm telling you about us as kids, it's like, oh, we were all just friends. And like, there was n no way of knowing that in the friend group, one of them was going to be an in-law one day. And, yeah. Oh, that's so weird. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, not in a bad way, but like just so trippy to think like how life throws plot twists into the it, mix. It's, it's trippy because I feel like I remember 
uh, one of our friends like always talking about like, oh, well, what will my kids be like one day? What will my kids be like one day? Or like, what's their dad going to be like? And the dad was like upstairs the whole time. Like <laughs> He's like literally playing mash, like hurry up yeah. and like fill up the rest of this. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, how weird. I love stories like that. So they move into Dean's home and they're married now. And Dean's mom is absolutely thrilled. Uh, she, as you know, Dean likes to run away in the middle of the night to join you know, these fringe groups, right? So she's like, thank God, Tina's here. She can keep him grounded. Like, they're so happy together. Maybe he'll stay home and be safe, right? Mm -hmm. So she helped Tina get a job and Dean was working as a carpenter. She helped them buy a car. Like, she really wanted them to start a life that didn't have that, like, ominous uh, fringe cult group in, mm -hmm. in their background at all. So... When they announced that 16-year-old Tina was pregnant, the family could not be happier, which is wonderful. Because, again, I feel like you, we don't usually have stories like this where someone sure, yeah, let's just, gets let's pregnant just as take a teenager what we can. and it's perfectly wonderful and happy and everyone's excited. Uh, so that the family is so supportive and their baby, Holly, which is one of my favorite names, actually, That's was born name. on January 24th, 1980. So Dean and Tina and their little baby Holly moved to and this is where it gets a little compl not really complicated, but my brain just kind of wanders. So the couple moves with their baby to Maryland because Tina's sister Sherry lives up there. But Dean was, as we've mentioned, like a, a free spirit. He was like, I don't want to stay here that long. He convinced her to move to Texas from Maryland. OK. And nobody can really remember exactly why Dean's mom is like, I'm pretty sure he got a job offer in Texas. But Tina's sister's like, I don't think that's why they went to Texas. There's not really a clear reason. But Tina didn't really want to go like she liked living with her sister up in Baltimore. And so she was hesitant to leave her family behind, but she had an allegiance to Dean and her baby. So the three of them headed to Texas in August of 1980, and they lived with Dean's uncle in Louisville for a while. Okay. And at first, everything was hunky-dory. Uh, they stayed in frequent co contact with Dean's mom, who was, you know, obviously a little worried that they're kind of bopping around. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was comforted that they were calling and saying everything was fine and safe. Uh, Dean and Tina actually got their own place and were doing really well. And Tina said she was happy. But then in November of that year, it had been roughly a month since anyone had heard from Dean or Tina. And Dean's mom was getting more and more worried by the day. Some people even say that Dean and Tina actually never told their families they got their own place. And their families found out like through other people. Oh, um, OK. Which kind of adds a layer of mystery. Like, why wouldn't they tell yeah. If they're keeping in close contact with his mom, it would be weird to like for some reason leave out the fact they got a place together. That's a big that's a big announcement. Yeah. You'd think so. Yeah. So that's just some of the sources say that. I'm not 100% confident in that, but it is a little odd. Um then Dean's cousin mentioned to Dean's mom who's already on edge, right? Dean's cousin says, "Oh, well, you know, there was this weird religious group in town." Oh. And she goes, "Ding oh, ding ding. Fuck." And he described them as uh, these nomadic people in white robes and no shoes on. And Donna, Dean's mom, is like, God damn it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's happening again. It's like, oh, the I know them all too well. I'm, yeah, And, you know, she's just like, they're just bopping around. I've heard all too well. They tried to sleep in my house. Um, <laughs> and so she just, pray all she could do really was just wait and pray that Dean and Tina wouldn't get involved with them, especially now that they had the little baby. Yeah. So she is just waiting, becoming more and more concerned with no word from Dean or Tina and the other, all the other strange details coming in from other family members. Uh, she knew something was wrong. So Tina's sister, Sherry, up in Maryland, sent a letter to her sister, Tina, and said, I had just gotten one recently. And within a couple of days, I sent one back mm -hmm. and it was returned with moved, left no forwarding address. Oh, shit envelope so sherry and donna are now like both sides tina's family and dean's family are both like something is very wrong yeah yeah so donna called her family in texas who said oh yeah dean tina and holly left to join those guys in robes 
and she's thinking it's my worst nightmare is true they've gone off with this group and now i don't know how to get in touch with them weirdly this part creeps me out a few weeks later donna gets a call from a detective in california who says oh we have located a a car in your name and it was the car that she had bought for Mm. dean and tina and they said uh the car was found abandoned we'd like to return it to you and she said okay please yeah if you could return it to me and they said meet us in the park at midnight and what bring bring a thousand dollars okay no thank you <laughs> yeah what the fuck so she's like let me call the police real quick so yeah, she calls well, the police me, do, do, do. <laughs> the, re- the real police she's like let me put you on hold um she calls the real police uh because spoiler alert that's not a real detective as far as we know right um <laughs> and she explains the situation and they're like yeah that's not really a thing but you know you can go ahead and meet with them be careful they're not gonna they didn't bring anyone out to help her they just kind of said you know you can do what you want i would have been like i need someone to escort me like or like what if this is like the What if we're about to bust a gang or something? Like, I think what so they actually do end up looking into it. Um, she, I think she just maybe you know what I think might have happened is they told her it's probably not a good idea, and she went against their advice. Does that make? I feel like that makes more sense. The police were probably like, "This is very suspicious. Maybe don't do this." And she was like, "No, but I want to find my son, so I'm going to do it anyway." Right, right, right. I think there was no choice, no chance. Like she was going to do it no matter what. Um, so they did arrive with the car and um they very clearly were not police they were teenagers in white robes with bare feet Mm -hmm. and so they could pretend over the phone to be detectives but they won't commit to like wearing shoes to pretend to be a detective like also like their like (laughs) their line was not very good like you know all of them sat together trying to craft the best thing to say over the phone and they were like just bring a thousand dollars and don't think about it also at midnight <laughs> yeah that'll, like, that's a killer that's a killer line also i feel like um that feels like the beginning of a horror movie driving up to a dark park and people in white robes are waiting for you there's like a, a swing set in the background swinging Ooh. slowly and people in white robes and no shoes absolutely it's a horror movie this story creeps me the creep out i don't know I I don't I don't like it. I don't like it. But she meets with them and they do give her the car. So, you know, at least she got that out of them. Um then the police showed up. Okay. Okay. So they did they did uh I didn't want to spoil the surprise. The okay, thank twist. God. I was like this I like I don't know a better time for a cop with like an axe to grind, like to show up and want to like solve something. Be like, like this oh, is your moment. Jesus freaks are back. I yeah. better get on over to the park at midnight. Yeah. So they did. They did show up and they did uh, actually send Donna home and said, "Um, we'll take it from here." So at gotcha. the very least, you know, they really uh, they did step in. Okay. So they question the teens, and in the end, police learn ultimately that dean and tina had joined a group called christ family and this was like this extremist fringe group or at least a fringe group i don't know how extremist but they were a fringe group and they followed a leader named lightning amen (laughs) so many jokes okay it's but there's so many jokes you can't even like you know it's like impossible to land on one it's like overwhelming (laughs) <laughs> it's just wild like this guy and have you heard of him because i'd actually heard no. of him no i'd heard of him because i mean only once or twice just because his name is so wackadoo um but yeah he was basically like a surfer who then became a cult leader <laughs> like i mean you know you can see it i don't need to probably give you any more detail than that it's you can imagine you can imagine i i can he looks like yeah. thor but he like but like dorky thor dorky thor here let me send you a picture i because i don't know what thor looks like and i don't know what a chris hemsworth <laughs> oh <laughs> he does not look like chris hemsworth <laughs> i hear lightning i think thor i don't know okay that's fair um no i'll send you a picture of jesus amen jesus um, um no it's lightning amen oh i'm sorry lightning amen christ family part of the jesus people movement <laughs> it's like <laughs> sorry folks 
It's like those people who have a bunch of like the initials at the end of their name. Like they could be like Esquire, MD, oh, God, whatever. Yes. You know? Jesus follower. Yeah. Yeah. Did you get my photo of him? He's the one in the beard. Oh my or God. No, he does not look like Chris up. Hemsworth. Certainly not. He looks like. He looks. Wa- you know what? Now that I've seen his face, he looks exactly like Lightning Amen. Exactly. Okay. I'm glad you understand now. Yeah. He looks I- like a cult leader. From yes. like I mean these are newer photos but like he basically looked like that in black and white in sem- <laughs> in a robe okay Oof. okay uh, um so as you can imagine this guy is a, a hell of a hell of a guy um they according to the teenagers they told police oh don't worry Dean and Tina joined the the group of their own free will which like having to insist that is a little shady yeah, to me. That but, makes okay. me think immediately a gun Don't was worry, involved. They, they they loved it the whole time. <coughs> right, guys? <laughs> like they really wanted to they be ha- here. Tell them you had the best time. <laughs> tell them. <laughs> tell them about lightning. Amen. And how he how much he looks like Chris Hemsworth. Okay. Say yeah. It. Well, if if he heard me call him Chris Hemsworth, I think all of a sudden they try to summon me into the cult or whatever so i think you'd be in trouble um so they said as part of joining the cult they willingly joined and they willingly gave up their worldly possessions and relationships but they said they wanted to make sure donna got the car back since it was in her name um but they knew they couldn't quite contact her themselves so they created this falsified detective plan and Mm -hmm. uh ultimately they said we can't tell you where dean tina or holly are because you know our members are nomadic and they travel in small groups you know one minute we're in new smyrna next minute we're in old smyrna who knows uh but yes so they basically said we don't know where they are we can't help you and Mm -hmm. in the end police were like well there's really no evidence of a crime like they brought you your car Mm -hmm. you know so she was so. like, well, I guess. So basically they just let him go back to California. And at this point, Donna is like, okay, it's very, very clear now that my son and his new wife and baby are in a cult. So best she could, she just imagined, she kind of created like a, a world in her mind where they were living happily in a commune somewhere. And, um, you know, she tried to just at least believe that story to keep her sanity, help her sleep at night. Um, but she said she really, really struggled with that. Um, Cherry, Tina's sister, later said, we pictured Tina living on some sort of group commune, having a very good, quiet life, them with Holly and maybe more children even. That's at least what I had hoped for. Unfortunately, nobody would ever hear from Dean or Tina again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Saw so on January... Yeah, unfortunately. On January 6, 1981... Uh, <laughs> A guy was out with his dog. You can imagine where this is going. A guy was out with his dog when the dog finds something exciting in the woods and mm-hmm. brings it to his owner. And it is a decomposing arm. Oh. So, th- yeah. Okay. Surprise. Uh, I mean, so I the sensed o- a body. I did not know it would be just one part of just the body. An ar- just an arm. It's at Jeez. least not a disembodied foot. I know how you feel about those. Mm-hmm. So it's just the arm. Um, Of course, he calls the Harris County Sheriff's Office and searchers find the remains of two people in a wooded area north of Houston. The woman had been strangled to death and the man had died of a skull fracture. Mm. It was theorized that the man may have been killed defending the woman when she was attacked and was, was hit over the head. The forensics experts on the case referred to them as Romeo and Juliet because it looked like they died trying to save one another. And, Mm -hmm. you know, obviously tragic young couple dying, matches romeo and juliet so they had no way of knowing their real names um there was really no headway made on the case i mean if you think about it like dean and tina are in a cult somewhere they're not being reported as missing and so they're not in a database as missing so the people in texas just don't know who these people are and the case goes cold and the couple was buried together uh without names nameless Mm. in a county cemetery and they stayed that way for decades Ooh! it wasn't until 2011 the national institutes of justice awarded harris county in particular a grant 
to exhume unidentified remains to collect DNA samples and pursue new investigations on cold cases. Oh, fun. Yeah. Fun. So in 20, fun. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's a lining like I'm that. talking about. It's yeah. coming on up. In 2018, Census of Medical Examiners and Coroners accounted for 11,000 sets oh. of unidentified human remains in oh my God. U.S. Medical Examiner and Coroner's offices. And that does not include people who have been interred, who have been buried. So wow. that's just the people that are, unfortunately, their bodies are just in limbo almost in an office somewhere in storage. Yeah. And nobody knows you know, they're nameless. It's, it's, it's scary. So, you know, places are trying to use the new technology, DNA, familial matching to solve who some of these people might be, which mm-hmm. we saw with the lady of the dunes. Remember that yeah. thought, nobody yeah. will ever figure this out. So of course, matching identities of missing people to their remains is already, you know, um, what do you call it? A monumental task. Sure. Um, but l- since Dean and Tina were never even marked missing, it's not like they were in a list or a database that you could point to. So we may never have known who the Lady of the Dunes was, who Dean and Tina were, except for the advent of genetic genealogy, our favorite, our favorite tool, which of course we've covered in several other cases. Uh, Golden State Killer is probably like the most groundbreaking one most because happening. it set off, yeah, and set off the most you know, kind of offshoots of of the same kind of procedure being done. Um, and so what happens is DNA samples of victims and murderers, such as Golden State Killer, are entered into public genealogy databases like Ancestry dot com, and then they are used to find matching relatives. So in twenty twenty two, as in Last year, as we record this, two women named Misty Gillis and Allison Peacock, best name ever. Love it. Love it. Used a grant to pursue the 1981 Romeo and Juliet cold case, as it was called. Awesome. And interestingly enough, that was made possible due to podcasts because (gasps) Ashley Flowers' company, Audio Chuck, Ashley Flowers, who hosts Crime Junkie, Audio Chuck actually gave them the grant. Wow. To to pursue this. It's just so kick ass. So these two women get this grant from Audio Chuck and they are able to pursue basically the way that uh the I think it was Misty who described it. She said she was just scrolling through. They had made like composites of what the remains would l- maybe look like in mm-hmm. life, you know, like reconstruct their their faces. And so she's scrolling through a bunch of them, like John and Jane Doe's, and she said she sees the photo of the male victim of this Romeo and Juliet case. And she's like, something just clicked, and I knew I had to find out who this man was. Like, I had oh. to find out his story. Okay. Ooh, ooh, gives me the goose cam. So they start moving in a matter of weeks. The two of them were able to track down family members, and they gave Dean's sister, Debbie Brooks, a call, which must have been quite a call after decades. So uh, awkward, too. Like, how do you just... So awkward. You know, if, like, like they, oh, if, they if one of them right had away, phone they anxiety... Her. I was going to say, uh, I would have sent her a little WhatsApp, said, hey, emoji, emoji. <laughs> hey, girl. Hey, yeah. girl. Weird weather we're having, right? Anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah. LOL. I know. It's just like, I don't know how people. I'm sweating just thinking about it. I like, know. How... <laughs> I don't know how people do it, really. Um, but they called her up and said, hey, do you happen to have a missing relative? Because we kind of got this DNA match that mm-hmm. that hit you and your family. Of a John Doe. And she said, yeah, my brother disappeared like decades ago and we never heard from him again. And Misty said, okay, well, we believe we found him and we believe we found his partner, whoever he was with. And Debbie said, that would be Tina. You found Dean and Tina. And then there was a brief pause and Debbie asked, but where's the baby? (gasps) And Allison said, that was the biggest shock I had ever had in my life. We were focused on finding them. It didn't occur to 
us that they would have had a child. Like the whole mm-hmm. time they're just thinking, oh, this young couple was killed. We're going to find their identities. And then this bombshell of like, well, where's their baby? Mm-hmm. Because no unidentified child remains had been found in right. that area. Was she like, did, were they originally taken in by this group because they had a baby and then they killed them for the baby? You know, like. No. Oh. Which feels like that could very much be the plot but no it's actually not not quite that way and we still don't totally know what happened and again that's that's where the hope comes in i hope that we can right. <laughs> figure this one out at this point um not only were there not remains found with dean and tina but there were no remains in any registers that like dna matched with them so mm. this baby wasn't even listed unidentified and so they thought maybe she's still alive right and if she were alive she would be 41 years old okay and they were killed when she was several months old right so like they if the so the group took the baby years. in they probably like maybe changed her name she wouldn't even know her name was holly so Eventually, a cold case unit took on the search for Holly in January 2022. And meanwhile, Donna and her family, of course, had Donna, who's still alive, that's his Dean's mom, Mm -hmm. had to reckon with Dean and Tina's deaths and, you know, put some closure there at the very least. It has to at least be because you hope that this entire time they were out with their group, but to know that they they died so early, you know? I mean, just months. Yeah, this whole after. time you thought that at least they were around for like maybe 10 or 20 years. and I know. But I even know. in that whole time you were imagining that maybe one day they'd call, they weren't even alive. Oh that's my God. exactly. Oh my I God. mean, that's exactly. You could have taken the words right out of her mouth because Donna, Dean's mom, said, I was on the freeway once and this young man passed me and it looked so much like my son. I used to tell myself he's still out there somewhere and he'll ring the doorbell and say, hey, mom. Mm. And now that hope had been quashed. but. You know, at the very least, they had a glimmer of hope in that maybe they could find Holly, which Mm -hmm. would be Donna's granddaughter. So, unbelievably, the investigation pretty quickly led them to Holly Marie, (gasps) who was alive and well and still named Holly Marie. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Wow. I did not see that coming. Right? That's why I just didn't even respond to you. I was like, I don't want to give anything away. (laughs) I'm just going to let you let that one let it rest. Let it fester. Thank you. Let it fester. Gross. So Holly Marie explained that she had been adopted decades ago and it would have been just before her parents' murders. Oh. Is how the timing worked. So maybe when they so, had to give up all their relationships and included their kid? Yeah. Wow. Ding, ding, ding. Oh, because wow. That saved her life. It did. Thankfully. Thank God. So they found her. She said, I was adopted. And her story was on November 8th, 1980, her adoptive father, Philip McGoldrick, he was a pastor in Yuma, Arizona, and he was at church. He was at Seventh Day Adventist Church in Yuma, and he was getting ready for, I don't know, he's in his office getting ready for a sermon or something. It's around 2 p.m., and he hears a knock at the door of the church. So he goes and opens the door and sees two women wearing white robes and no shoes on. Uh And he said they kind of looked like nuns, but he said they looked like nuns who had slept in a field. (laughs) (laughs) That's like the best dad insult (laughs) I've ever heard. So he said they were just really unkempt and they looked it. And so Philip was familiar with this group already because, you know, he worked at a church and he had seen them around and he had helped with feeding them and giving them provisions and that kind of thing before. So he's like, what would you like? What can I help you with? Do you need food? You know, do you need shelter? They say, we need someone to take a baby Mm. from us. And according to them, their explanation was that women and men traveled separately in this sect. Oh. And there was no room for a baby in their lifestyle. So someone's got to take the baby. Mm -hmm. And they said, one of our sisters decided to give hers up. So Philip is immediately skeptical. He's like, I don't know. I want to talk to the mother and make Mm -hmm. sure that like, she's good with this. So he asked if they were a hundred percent sure about this. They said, 
Well, one time, we left a baby alone in a laundromat with a note attached to it, and we thought this was a better alternative. Oh! Would love to know where that baby is now. Jeez. Yeah, what the fuck? And so he goes, well, shit, like, obviously now I have to take this baby, because what... If I give it back, they're going to go put it in a laundromat somewhere. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. He's like, it's safer for me to take the baby. So, you know, thankfully he takes the baby in. He's scared they're going to abandon it somewhere. And the sisters drove with Philip to his house to speak to his wife because he's like, let me, let's bring my wife into this one before I make any like decisions. So interestingly, when he got in the car, the sisters, quote unquote, introduced him to the mother of Mm. holly marie the baby wow okay although she was very quiet didn't talk much and the the leader quote-unquote of the trio did most of like the logistics and the talking so they get to philip's house now with tina who is the mother of holly and they have the baby too and philip and his wife connie speak directly to tina and they say you know are you sure this is what you want she insisted that, yes, it is what she wanted. She gave them Holly's original birth certificate and a document signed by Dean, the father, mm. relinquishing all parental rights to Holly. And Connie, the uh, the pastor's wife, just couldn't understand this decision and kept asking, you know, Tina, are you sure? Is this really what you want? And Tina said it was what she had to do. Oof. Yeah. They asked her repeatedly, but she was so adamant that eventually they just accepted it. And because it was a Saturday, there were no lawyer's offices open. And so Philip and Connie went with these three women to a notary and Tina signed a document giving up Holly. And then the sisters left within two hours of showing up with a baby at his doorstep. They were gone. And he was, you know, he and his wife raised Holly Marie alongside their other daughter as sisters. Wow. Isn't that wild? Mm. Wow. So Connie and Philip met with a lawyer, you know, because they were like, we still want to make sure this is all above board. And they did actually publish a notice of an abandoned child, almost as like to give one more chance to Tina if she wanted Mm -hmm. to change her mind. Um, And the legal guardians had six months to claim Holly and take her back, but they never did. We know now that Tina had been murdered in that Mm -hmm. time period. So after six months, the McGoldricks began an official adoption of Holly Marie. Um, They'd already, you know, fallen in love with her after having her for six months. And now their oldest daughter or their only daughter had a sister. So they had two daughters, which is kind of special. So Holly grew up knowing this story about these women appearing at her father's church. Um, But neither she nor her parents could imagine that, you know, shortly thereafter, both her parents were brutally murdered Mm -hmm. and had been sitting unidentified for 40 years. Like that definitely was not on the radar. So on June 7th, 2022 detectives approached Holly, who is now 42 and a mother of five. Wow. And spoke, I know like a full ass adult life and spoke to her about her past. And they confirmed she was indeed Holly Marie, daughter of Tina and Dean. She, they had the original birth certificate and everything. Wow. And that day they said, do you want to hop on a Zoom call and meet your family? And she said, what's a Zoom call? (laughs) (laughs) But she did. uh, Remember, this was 2022. So like, you know. Right. We were all getting used to it. Zoom was popping off. Okay. So they get on a Zoom call and she is like just totally overwhelmed. She's meeting several family members. Like she's just over the moon. And she later said, I had this family that had prayed and been searching for me and wanted to know me, wanted to find me. And incidentally, she was located on the birthday of Dean, her late father. Yeah. And so she called it a birthday gift from heaven. He's like, it only took 42 birthdays, but okay. Yeah. (laughs) So Holly met her grandmother who had been searching for her all this time and hoping for to find her someday and they reunited and you can go watch the video i think it's on like good morning america or something you know uh, of them reuniting for the first time and she just says like thank you for praying holly said it's just really sweet and uh 
when they were reunited, Tina's sister, Sherry, actually had a dream that Tina was playing with her daughter, Holly, uh, like she used to do when she lived in Maryland with them. And she said, I think that was a sign that Tina is finally resting in peace, knowing that Holly has been reunited with her family. So sweet. I know. And so, of course, now the next step remains to discover what the hell happened to D- Dean and yeah. Tina. Um, they believe the case can be solved and there actually is one person of interest and it is a woman who was there the day of Holly's adoption. The woman who Ah. approached Philip and said, you know, take this baby and her name's Rosemary Garcia. And apparently she had orchestrated this whole adoption and was like a main member of this religious fringe group. So they're looking at her for answers. So I, I do feel like there could be an actual solution to this. Um, and in, weirdly enough, Rosemary had three daughters of her own, I guess, that she didn't have to give up. So oh, that's whatever, convenient. Isn't it? And I mean, I'm glad for their sake, but but also, what the fuck? Um, and <laughs> their names are Jill, Joy, and Jan, and people called them Rosemary and the three J's. <laughs> Rosemary and the Duggars. Yeah. <laughs> It does sound, it does, yeah. Oh, they copied it. They copied Rosemary. (laughs) So anyway, um, investigators think she probably has some sort of information that could lead them to answers. And the Texas Attorney General told people, as long as there are people still alive that know, we've got a chance of solving it. Just like finding baby Holly, it took decades, but eventually we ended up with the right information to get that part of it figured out. And, um, you know, of course, the easy assumption is that the cult was had orchestrated the murder. Right. But like we can't be positive um, mm-hmm. because they were also living kind of a dangerous lifestyle of uh, sleeping outside and, and traveling in small groups. And, you know, it made them vulnerable to violent crime. So perhaps they had been killed hitchhiking, sleeping outside somewhere, um, staying with a stranger overnight. But, uh, you know, a lot of people believe the cult did have something to do with it for obvious Mm -hmm. reasons. So Donna actually passed away um, last month or sorry, two months ago in October. But Holly and her family are still hoping for closure. And Holly has since written a book about this whole experience. It's called Finding Baby Holly, colon, Lost to a Cult, Surviving My Parents' Murders and Saved by Prayer. (laughs) Wow. No big deal. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Talk about it like an icebreaker at a party. I know. It's like two truths and a lie, but they're all true. Yeah. Ah! yeah. <laughs> um, and so in this book, she kind of writes about the perspectives of her family members so she can put together her own understanding of her parents and who her parents were and, and kind of rebuild like the, I don't know, the family that she was separated from all that time ago. So together with both of her families, Holly and one of the researchers, Allison Peacock, you remember, Mm -hmm. they launched the Dean and Tina Lynn Klaus Memorial Fund, which helps other people search for lost loved ones using genetic genealogy, which I think is just so badass. And um, Holly says she wants to bring what she calls miracles to other families because she feels like she was given a miracle. Oh, yeah. So, you know, this one had some some positivity at the end that was a great one christine oh well thank you so much i mean that was probably the only time i feel like somewhat relieved in the least twisted way possible i I actually can say i enjoyed the story without feeling like a total piece of garbage without just like just cringing the whole time like there was actually some positivity going on yeah yeah it's i still want to know why they were killed and why they were killed next to each other if they're supposed to be separate from each other i wonder i mean one of the theories i think one of the family members believes that they tried to leave the cult oh i see and that makes together perhaps especially when that i mean if you think about it this is all speculation on my part but if you think about it if her adoptive parents put a uh a notice of an abandoned child and said Mm -hmm. you have six months to retrieve your child who knows if they tried to go back for her and right were caught leaving the who knows i mean again this is just me speculating but oh yeah no um, those those make sense um hopefully they figure it out man good story christine my gosh let me send you a picture because it every time they showed this picture i was just so sad because it's such a cute little family and just to know like 
Or like how I'm saying, I'm finally feeling relieved, and you're like, great, let me bum you out real quick. Oh, let me show you the murder victims. <laughs> but Aww, yeah, they're cuties. Know. Aren't they cute? And they're so young. I mean, it's just terrible. Yeah. And they were so excited about their baby, and it's just really sad. At least she finally got to see a picture of her with them. So she, yeah, they gave her that photo, and it was, of course, like, life-changing. You yeah. Know, to have, and she has... I think uh, somebody made, I'm trying to see, a painting of them together, like the three Aww. of them together um, for her. It's just, you know. Very sweet. I'm just glad she at least got like, some closure out of all of it. But Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you everyone for listening to another reason and episode <laughs> of And That's Why We Drink. Uh, and what, when does, when does this come out? This comes out right around now, right before Christmas. Yeah. Are you getting excited for Christmas, Christine? I am. I am. Lisa's maybe you'll get a down. new ear for by January oh, or something. Maybe I can. Um, maybe the membrane of my eardrum will heal oh. over. Wouldn't that be a Christmas miracle? Little drummer boy, it Christine. <laughs> Dr- ear drummer boy. Ear drummer boy, Christine. Just fixing up that membrane that she punctured. Uh, reminder that we are about to go back on tour every day. My uh, vagus nerve freaks out a little more. Um, but please come buy tickets because the only thing that would make it worse is if nobody showed up. <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't say that. That's and, not funny. And <laughs> uh, I just, I hope everyone's having a good time. So if you want to listen to more of our ramblings, you can go over to Patreon where we will be doing an, an after hours. And uh, we'll see you there. And. That's why we drink.